What's up, everyone? Here we have episode 48 of We The Ether podcast, a conversation between myself and Kyle Buller. He is a partner on Psychedelics Today podcast, and all resources and links are in the description below if you're interested in checking those out. Kyle and myself get into conversations around breath work and different types of trauma therapies, as well as some psychedelic stuff. So stay tuned. It's going to be a good one. Don't forget to hit that like, add this to your favorite, share it with a friend, and hit that subscribe as well. I'll see you again soon. Good to have you on. Uh, for anyone who's not familiar with what you're involved in, uh, would you mind just introducing yourself, what you what you do on a day-to-day basis, um, and you know, we can get into that. Sure. Yeah. Uh, so my name is Kyle Buller. I'm one of the co-hosts and co-founders of a website and psychedelic podcast called Psychedelics Today. Um, it's kind of like a full-time job. Um, been kind of part-time. I'm also finishing up my master's in uh, counseling and somatic psychology in a week and a half. So I'm excited about that. And um, yeah, so my background's in mental health. Um, I have an undergrad in transpersonal psychology where I studied um, the healing potential of psychedelics, uh, holotropic breath work, shamanism, plant medicine, stuff like that. So um, it's a quick little bio. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Congratulations on almost finishing up one week. That's pretty. pretty I'm excited. <laughs> How long have you been at that for? Uh, I'm on the three year track, so it's been three years. Mm, okay. And where does that lead you once, once you once you finished all that up? Is it kind of just in line with what you're already doing? It's just more, more giving you that certification of it? Yeah, um, it leads towards uh, a counseling license, so I can become a licensed therapist and counselor. Um, but now that you know things are kind of taking off at Psychedelics Today, I'm trying to figure out what my next step is. Um, right. My whole goal is to be able to practice psychedelic psychotherapy and get involved in some of the MDMA studies and, and whatnot. So I don't know what the future has in store. I'm just trying to uh, ride the wave. <laughs> right, right. Well, it's definitely, I mean, if it's in line, it makes sense. I mean, it, it's crazy the way technology has been going and the fact that you guys do have this podcast and, you know, it's just growing and the podcasting community as a whole is just booming over the past five to 10 years. It seems even, exciting. it's starting to catch up a lot with, with YouTube and video. And I think it's because people's attention is so valuable that the ability to multitask while listening to a podcast it, it's it's amazing like you'd be driving personally i listen to them when i walk my dogs or i'm working out like i've almost cut out music entirely just because i feel like i don't you know there's there's some really loose research around you can actually get a performance enhancement from listening to music to like five ten percent but you know I, I i find that i get more value long term by taking in podcasts and books audiobooks during you know workout times and whatnot so i think it's just become more conducive with everyone's day-to-day experience they could just easily pop in some headphones and you know actually take in some information it's like going to school so it's yeah. like you, you going uh down a um i guess doing like a clinical practice or um, having like a coaching or therapy would it be a physical location that you you would consider doing or just because in, the, in, in the future yeah, in the future, I'd love to have a, some sort of physical location where we could do integration therapy, integration work, or coaching. Um, we would love to be able to get into the space if things become legal eventually and maybe offer MDMA psychotherapy. Um, cannabis and ketamine are really interesting. There's a couple models out there that people have been using cannabis assisted psychotherapy and also uh, ketamine assisted psychotherapy. So, you know, that's something that we're, we're looking into. We've also been looking into doing some legal work in other countries where um, substances are legal. So um, that's on the horizon too, maybe. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It definitely- it's exciting because it's like a new field and nobody, it's like we're all kind of trying to figure it out and we don't really know where the future is going. And there could be a lot of possibilities. There could be a lot of like, you know, steps backwards. It's it's really just at the forefront of a lot of things. So. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. time will tell yeah it's like one of those uh two steps forward one step back sort of thing but i mean you're, you are making progress I find that this is such a, a fast-paced moving area of research especially when it comes to how it's being applied towards therapy trauma therapy which i know is something you specialize in which is the main reason i reached out to you actually is because i think a lot of people are dealing with a lot of trauma not entirely sure where to turn a lot of them are going to like uh, chemical uh chemicals that would be produced you know like drugs over the counter drugs or prescription drugs and i find a lot of those aren't they're not natural remedies they have a lot of side effects the the ability for the body to heal itself has started it's been, it's been overlooked for so long that i think a lot of people are starting to tune in to that fact and i think that social media as a whole when it's used properly i would say <laughs> it's driving people to a better understanding of that 
as opposed to, you know, they're not, they're not going to look at Kim Kardashian, but, but they're interested in actually improving themselves, personal growth and development. That's what this podcast is about. And I know Psychedelic Today is heavily involved in that as well. So mm-hmm. um, I just wanted to kind of get a rundown of what sort of trauma therapies, breath work, uh, training or therapy that you actually do with, with anyone that uh, approaches you. Yeah, so um, I take more of a somatic approach. Um, so within, I'm at my internship, I'm, I'm uh, counseling undergraduate students, um, and I do get some people in there with PTSD. Um, but my framework is more like within somatic psychology, which is more body oriented uh, psychotherapy. And the reason why I got into that was because uh, when I was at my undergrad, I cu- stumbled across this breathing technique called holotropic breath work. And for me, I have a you know pretty significant trauma background with having a near death experience, a pretty intense snowboarding accident, and um, you know it really left me pretty ungrounded. It left me really detached from my body, um, actually kind of afraid to be in my body because I had so much trauma and just trying to develop a new relationship to it was kind of like scary in a sense. Um, and once I kind of stumbled across uh, psychedelics, uh, I mean, I just had a total reframe of my experience. And so that's actually what got me on the path was I was like, I wouldn't, I don't know if it was like full blown PTSD. I wasn't having flashbacks, but you know, pretty heavy existential crisis, a lot of uh, depression and suicidal thinking um, right after that near death experience. Like I had a pretty big high for like six months and then reality started to set and I was like, oh my God, what, what's going on here? And I was 16 at the time. So coming back to high school and just trying to be a teenager was pretty difficult when I'm thinking about life and death and what's the meaning here and what are we all doing? And, um, you know, it wasn't until I think I was like 18 or 19, um, I stumbled across some psilocybin mushrooms with a friend and went out into the woods and, it, you know, I ate it as an escape. I, I didn't know anything about the th- therapeutic aspects. I really didn't know anything about psychedelics in general. I just was like, you know what, I, I just need to kind of get away from my thoughts for a little bit. And in that experience, I was able to relive parts of my near-death experience, and it helped me kind of recontextualize that experience. And it showed me that it was a blessing. It wasn't such a curse, and this new way of thinking is a blessing, and I don't need to sit there and dwell on it and be so depressed about it. But it really helped me kind of just take all that trauma and almost like uh, transmute it into some sort of positive um, action. Like it really got me interested in the consciousness and mind. And I was like, ah, I really want to go back to school and start studying stuff like this. So it was really a uh, transformative um, experience for me. And I got caught up in that for a little bit, um, trying to explore my mind through substances. And then it wasn't until I got um, to my undergrad and started to... um, have experiences with holotropic breath work, and that brought me back to my body. Um, psychedelics can really put you out in the mind and kind of out there in the ethers, but breath work really put me back to my body and helped me process that in such a different way. And I realized that so much of that trauma is actually stored in my body. Um, and being able to have a technique to work with it in a different way, which is so beneficial. I mean, it just helped me develop a new relationship with my body in some sense, not be as afraid of it. Um, and you know, you see that with trauma, people dissociate a lot, um, that experience PTSD or or, um, any sort of trauma disorder. Um, a lot of them are very disconnected from their bodies because that's part of a survival mechanism. When something traumatic happens, you know, you kind of need to detach, um, detach from pain and and whatnot, or, you know, the other side is where you're just hypervigilant and you need to be on edge and you're constantly just all over the place because the survival mechanism is kicking in until you get out or fight or whatever that is. So, um, so the way that I approach it is that, you know, a lot of this stuff is stored in our body and the breath can be a really powerful tool to help work with that experience. Um, so while I'm at my internship, I don't do too much trauma therapy just because the client's coming there, it's short term model. Um, but the basis is really, the framework that I come from is really trying to befriend some of these sensations in our body and become a little bit more curious. So when we have really difficult sensations or feelings come up, it's typical to just want to push them away, suppress them. But what is it like to explore it a little bit more? Um, Because there's a lot of information there. Sometimes we think of anxiety as this really negative thing, um, but anxiety is evolutionary. You know, it's, it's it's helped us survive. Anxiety tells you to run away if a bear is coming, you know? Um, So how can you start to learn to develop a relationship with um, anxiety in the body and and these feelings that emerge that we 
sometimes we'll think of, of negative, but you know, maybe there's some more information there. And being able to breathe through that um, can really help you explore that in, in such different ways. So mm -hmm. this is like a really new concept as well. And, and as you're speaking about it, I was almost the, the image came to mind of like a Rubik's cube mm. and not really being able to solve it. But now you have these tools that you can start to utilize, which are the breath or even psychedelics for that matter which allows you to then revisit any sort of trauma or anything else. But now you have the ability to actually solve this Rubik's cube. It's like you're coming from a new perspective and you're able to, to deal with it in a better way. So when you have people come in, uh, I assume there's the polar extreme. You have someone who has a, had a lot of trauma and is completely detached and um, you know maybe very neurotic or very highly aroused and really fight or flight is always you know on. And it's a difficult thing for them to even sit down and have a conversation. And I'm sure yeah. you have other people that haven't had such severe trauma. Um, can you give me any examples of, of either of those two extremes? Either someone that, well, let's even say someone that has come in, has had severe trauma, but was very receptive to the overall process and, and kind of just flowed through it a lot and, and then slowly, gradually improved versus someone that has had a lot of trauma. And I'm sure anyone listening knows both cases, um, but someone who's had a lot of trauma, but is not very receptive, not very open to new methods, new uh, ideologies of how they can start to resolve their issues and they're just very closed off so in, in the case of that how would you get someone out of that shell that they've you know started to cope themselves with you know somebody that's like shut down and really resistant to the process i think it's really important to be slow with it um so try not to force anything onto that person or try to force a technique like I'm thinking particularly of somebody that um, you know every time I try to offer some sort of meditation or some sort of like uh, technique they just shut down um, and I always have to do a check on myself of like what is what is my intention here you know like do I want to try to help this person and is this my intention to do this technique um, so I've been really trying to um, just take that stance of what does the client need right now and one time I just sat in silence for like 10, 20 minutes. And I said, you know, is this helpful for you just to sit here? And they said, yeah, this is really helpful. Um, you know, and sometimes if somebody is too detached, um, it is important to get them back in their body because they're not, they're not processing correctly. So, um, you know, maybe instead of focusing on so much of the internal, because, you know, these negative feelings are starting to come up and it's creating anxiety and it's causing them to dissociate or detach. Like, how could you just bring them back to the room? So like, just having them identify the color of the wall or what do you see around you? So really trying to focus on the external instead of the internal. And when I think of these levels of safety, right? So if somebody is like too active, too, they just can't control it. Like you really want to get them safe in their body. Um, and then, you know, if people are just too closed off and too in their body, you kind of want to try to get them to open up a little bit more. So um, yeah. It's, I, so I, I've developed a, my capstone project for my master's uh, is a, a, a capstone reviewing trauma literature and then, then also creating a breathwork framework to work with people in trauma. So I, I called it a trauma resolution with breathwork um, and, and thinking that, you know, I come from this, this background of holotropic breathwork and transpersonal breathwork, which is very uh, cathartic. Um, and I'll just give a quick rundown of what holotropic breathwork is. It was um, a breathing technique developed by a psychiatrist named Stanislav Grof and his wife, Christina Grof, over at Esalen in the 80s. And it's really cathartic. Uh, it's about three hour sessions. They're, they're usually done um, in weekend workshops or just really long days. And it's deep breathing with intensified music um, or evocative music. And people can have all sorts of experiences of reliving birth traumas, reliving past life experiences, reliving their childhood. And I mean, the experiences are infinite. I've seen so many different things, so it's hard to really just lump it all into one. Um, but sometimes that can be really activating for folks. And there is a potential for re-traumatization. Re <laughs> I can never say that word. Um, and when I think about somebody that's really suffering with a lot of trauma, you might not want to throw them into that right away. You want to get them grounded. You want them to feel safe in their body before they open that up because too much, too much information or, or too much of that exploring can re-trigger things and re-traumatize somebody. Um, 
so the way that I, I really view this is how do you get somebody grounded? How do you get them feeling safe in their body? And then how do you slowly start to process these feelings in their body or these sensations that cause discomfort? And then once you can get people really stable, then throw them into these really cathartic transpersonal states because then there's a whole layer of healing that happens under there. I mean, if I don't know if you've done any research on like transgenerational trauma or intergenerational trauma of trauma being passed down. Um, you know, that's really interesting. I mean, if you think about like past life experiences or stuff like that, it's like, how are things being passed down the family lineage? And maybe things that are starting to come up in your life might be influenced from the past. And in these transpersonal states, I think you can do some healing on that. Um, you know, you can just have a, it's almost like you clear it out, right? Like it's in our body. Um, and how do you use these techniques to like really clear stuff out that you don't even know that's really affecting you? Mm -hmm. so, Mm -hmm. That's really cool. I, I like how you even at the beginning there, you were saying how you had just sat down with someone in stillness. And this, this was, it's almost as if, and I, and I like how you are doing so, so well with your own introspective work that you're realizing, am I trying to, is this person's in so much trauma and now it's become a goal of mine to get them out of it. So now it's all of a sudden become your thing, which it never really should be, right? It's all about them. But if you then ground yourself and just sit with them in stillness, you can help bring them into that space. Um, yeah. And, and I'm not, I haven't done too much research on, on bio photons, but it's something I've, I've looked into briefly. And just simply with sitting with someone in stillness and holding your own uh, groundedness, you can, you can bring them in, into that and then you can start to work with them from there. And I wanted to get your opinion on, and I'm sure you're, you're, it's something you're a huge proponent of, um, but set and setting. And mm. that that's all, because you're opening up a can of worms, like you were saying, if, if, if you start to integrate things like uh, holotropic breathing, you know, you don't really know what's going to come up, but I mean, if you get to get them to that point, if the setting setting is correct, then they may be able to just open up. And uh, you know, I wanted to get your, your your thoughts on that. Either in your own practice of the people coming in, what typical setting do you put them in? What environment? And even if someone was to try some own introspective or breath work therapy on their own at home, what sort of environment would be conducive to uh, something that would be very therapeutic to them? Right. Um, so in terms of like the breath work that we offer, um, which is in the lineage of holotropic breath work, Joe and I call it transpersonal breath work because our teachers have, have taught it and deviate. It's pretty much the same thing. Um, our teacher Lenny adds a little bit of philosophy to it. Um, so those are done in a really safe setting um, up in Vermont. It's in the middle of the country. You can scream as loud as you want. It's in a retreat. It's in a group environment. So you're doing group work and you feel very supportive. And in that environment, you know, I've definitely worked with a lot of people up there that have had significant trauma backgrounds. And, um, you know, I've seen a lot of a lot of catharsis that's like, oh, man, this is scary. Are these people going to be OK? And they always they always uh, move through it. So having a really safe set and setting is crucial for working with transpersonal states, whether it's breath work or, or psychedelics. Um, because, you know, if you're gonna open somebody up and it's not safe, I mean, that can really re-traumatize somebody and it can be, you know, probably not best practice, right? Um, in more of like a, like a clinical setting, like assessing whether or not, you know, most clinical settings, you only have an hour with somebody. So like when I think about doing breath work with somebody and they're already activated, I'm like, you know, is this safe to open them up within an hour? Probably not. Like this is something that they might have to go somewhere else to get that support because an hour is just not, not significant enough to, to deal with that if they do open up. Um, and so I, yeah, the set and setting is really important. Being able to feel safe with facilitators or a counselor, um, to really explore that. Um, mm -hmm. What was your other question? I feel like you had two. Oh, and if someone was to be in their own, own home environment, so not so much in a clinical setting, but what sort of set and setting could they produce for themselves that would be conducive with something that would you know, heal them or be more therapeutic towards uh, their trauma? Right, yeah. Um, and that's something I, I do for myself. And so and that, that's actually what I was thinking about when I, when I started developing this capstone project of um, you know, I have this training in very long form breath work and it's very cathartic, very transpersonal, but how could this be used for regular people? Because people are always like, oh, could I do this on my own? Something like holotropic breath work or transpersonal breath work really encourage people just to go to a retreat, go to some place with somebody that has significant training and knowing how to deal with the, these experiences um, because they can really open you up and, you know, there's a thing called double bookkeeping. And if 
for example, you start breathing really heavy, the music's on and, you know, something from your past life comes up. Say if you were, you know, living in the jungle and all of a sudden you're being chased by a jaguar, um, you know, you're experiencing that, but part of yourself knows that you're on the mat and you're in a room. Um, but, you know, there's also this energy that wants to come up and actually experience it. And so, you know, you want to be in a safe setting and have somebody there with you that can help you move through that without trying to suppress it or stop it. Um, so we really encourage people to find facilitators or, or go to retreats for that specific thing. But, you know, if you want to do something like this at home, you can do modified uh, breathing techniques, which, you know, this is what I do. Like, for example, um, tuning more into the somatic. So, you know, I'll lay down on my floor, I'll take a couple of deep breaths, I'll tune into my body and I'll find some like tension and say, you know, I have some tension in my stomach. I'll place my hand on my stomach. I'll have some music going and then I'll take a couple deep breaths into that, that feeling. And I just become a little bit curious about that. I'm like, oh, what is there? Oh, it feels like anxiety. Well, what happens if I breathe into it and all right, I'll, I'll take a couple deep breaths into it. Oh, I noticed that it's a little bit tighter. And then one component of holotropic breathwork and transpersonal breathwork is that um, body work. But, um, so we're working with the body usually towards the end of the session. So I'll incorporate stuff like that at home. Like I'll start breathing into it. I'm like, oh, there's a tension there. And I'll slowly just do like some self massage on that knot or whatever that is and breathe into it some more. And then there's usually some content that, that will um, arise from it. And, you know, you can really take that at your own pace. And so it's not this huge activating breath work where you're trying to like elicit this huge response or this transpersonal experience, but you're just working with the energy and some of the sensations or tensions in your body in a, in a gentler way. Um, and, you know, I think that's pretty safe for people to explore at home, um, you know, if they're relatively stable and what, whatnot. Right, yeah, if they haven't had extreme trauma, then they might yeah. go be with a practitioner of some sort. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I actually do a very similar thing if I, if I feel like a tension or a knot or anything like that. It, actually, I'm a, I really love cannabis for that reason, uh, the THC and the CBD. But it, it just brings such an awareness to a certain, like to that certain area and allows me to really be patient and explore mm -hmm. that and, and take those breaths rather than if I was, you know, if I'm just running around and I'm working throughout the day and I get a little tight, and it's like, everything's so fast paced. You don't give it that time to take those several breaths that you may need to explore that region of your, of your body. And then if people end up becoming so unfamiliar with their body for that reason, because they don't take that time. It just becomes this, yeah. uh, this mechanical thing that they use and they just walk around the world, like without really considering it's a full, like it's multiple millions and what, billions of organisms <laughs> around. It's not just this yeah. thing, right? So you really have to treat it that way and address certain aspects of it, you know, from gut to brain to everything you can think of. Um, I do a lot of, uh, I'm actually an um, ambassador for Mobility One. And one of the reasons I align with them is because they are so big into stretching and opening up and, and using myofascial release to, to, even with breath work, in conjunction with breath work, because I think it's one of the main issues people have and it, it helps them carry their trauma. And mm -hmm. I actually was thinking about it, like it, it does help them carry that trauma because they're so locked down yeah. and, and when i talk about like chakra systems or anything like that people always kind of roll their eyes but it's just referencing the the kinetic chain of the flow of the entire body and how it just needs to be opened up and just flowing smooth like a river it's almost like when you start to put these logs and blocking the river it's going to create this dam and all of a sudden there's going to be you know things are going to happen either emotional breakdown or disease disorders but i think great great approaches include breath work yoga um these types of therapies. So yeah, I'm, I'm just glad you touched on that. Yeah, for um, sure. And so go ahead. And, and, well, something you were saying about the muscle tightness uh, really got me to think about some of the uh, uh, roots of somatic psychology. Um, starts with this uh, guy, Wilhelm Reich, who's a student of Freud. Um, and he developed this uh, technique, uh, breathing and stretching. And he, t he talked about character armoring. And so you know, when a dog feels really safe, the dog will lay back and open up. But when you're tense and constricted, you're constantly just hunching over, your shoulders are tight, you're breathing really shallow, you're not breathing into the belly. Um, so they worked with <clears throat> trying to open up this area. And um, a student of his uh, 
Alexander Lowen developed a, a technique called bioenergetics, but it's really about working with some of this character armoring, this tension in our body and being able to open up and relax into it. Um, and how much emotion is attached to, to these tensions that we're holding on to. Um, and it's interesting, you know, like if I'm in a session and I ask somebody, you know, if you close your eyes right now and tune into your body, do you feel any, any tension anywhere? And I don't know, this past, this past semester, everybody's been, ah, oh, I have so much constriction in my, my chest and my throat. Um, and, you know, what is it like to actually, like, put your shoulders back or stretch and really breathe into that and not realizing that they're just so constricted and they're hunched up and they're breathing shallow um, and how that really affects our emotions. Um, so there is a correlation between, like, muscle tension and, and emotions. Yeah, it's, it's just... And I think it ties in with one's ability to express themselves in the world, especially when you're talking about the chest area, the throat, you know, and, and we have these stupid little boxes now, right? Like, <laughs> we're both old enough that we don't, we didn't have these before, but now everyone's sitting there just like this, right? Completely shutting down their airways and, and everything, right? They don't really realize yeah. it. I think that that's part of the reason why we're seeing such an emergence of like depression and things like this in our, in our society is not just the fact that these little boxes are delivering an overwhelming amount of information. The majority of it's just garbage. And so you have to sift through the garbage and your head's completely locked down. So it just, it's, it's this terrible cyclic, like it's creating this terrible situation for everyone. And I don't think they're fully aware of how, how it's happened because it's been so fast. Like these devices are damn new. Like I swear our generation, uh, the ones growing up with it, not so much the ones being born with it, although probably then as well, but it's, it's like a research experiment. It really is. It's, it's going to affect us in 30 years, 40 years, 50 years. Like, we don't really have any, any, uh, any research around this. So it seems like we are like the case study. And depression just keeps emerging. And it's like part of the reason why I created the podcast that I have is because I, I think that you can sift through the garbage on these things and you can squeeze through some good information that hopefully someone gets that and they go, oh shoot, I should be doing this. That's, yeah. <laughs> up now. This is crazy. And they take it and they throw the phone away and they realize, hey, I'm feeling actually better. This is like mm -hmm. actionable steps I can take and I'm feeling better in the, in the now, this moment going forward in the nowness. So um, yeah, I just, <laughs> sorry, just follow a little bit of a tangent there. Yeah, just, no worries. Dude, I, I see people, especially when you go out, I'm sure you, sure you see them as well, crowds and crowds of people all with their heads down all complete and i think like this doesn't just happen in the shoulder region this goes right into their hips it goes into yeah. the chakra the whole system just breaks down and i know they're not exercising so i know they're not getting those natural biochemicals that are ready readily available to them so it just seems like a complete shutdown of, of the um, of human's biology and it's just being ignored because a lot of people are just adapting so readily to these technological devices um, I wanted to get your take or, or just if you could break down the three phase breathing. Uh, I heard you talk about with Joe actually on another, another podcast. You did. Oh, about like the capstone project that I created? Yeah. 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 And you actually well, have a cap score as well, right? What was that? You have a cap score as well, which you created or is that something? No. Um, the cap score is usually associated with PTSD. That might've been something. I don't know. We were probably talking about that, about something. I don't, I don't know. Um, but um, yeah, so this three-part breathwork um, theory that I have kind of formulated um, is really a bit for trauma, like people that are, that are experiencing like high anxiety, high trauma. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, I come from this background of long-form breathwork with more transpersonal kind of states. And I was thinking like, is this beneficial for people? I mean, typically we would screen somebody out that's you know, had some sort of hospitalization or some sort of mental health, health crisis within the past six months. But I'm thinking like, you know, I'm sure there's some people that get through the cracks and don't tell you that. And, um, you know, they show up to a workshop and then boom, they're just totally opened up and whoa, are we ready for that? And is that beneficial for them, right? Like I've had really, for me myself, like I've had really big experiences. And sometimes I thought like that was too much at times, you know, like now what am I doing with that? Um, so how could we work with it maybe in small little increments? And part of this idea came from, uh, I, don't, I don't know if you're familiar with Peter Levine's work. Um, no, no, not really. He wrote, I can't remember the books that he wrote, but um, he's really well known in the somatic world. And um, he's a trauma specialist. He developed a technique called somatic experiencing. And he talked about um, 
titrating trauma. So you don't want to release it all at once. You want to just like titrate these little experiences. So you're building safety in the body and it's just not so overwhelming for the nervous system. So I was taking that into consideration when working with these bigger transpersonal states. And so I was thinking, okay, the first stage is all about grounding and building rapport with your, you know, I oriented this, this capstone towards a clinical practice. So, you know, towards the counselor. Um, and how do we just use the breath to ground and just get into the body and to regulate the nervous system? Because our breathing can really just regulate the nervous system. And it's so cliche. It's like, oh, take a couple deep breaths. But, um, you know, br deep breathing activates the parasympathetic nervous system, which calms the body down. Um, so the first stage is really about if somebody is high anxiety, like panic attacks, trauma, and stuff like that. How do you just get them to become grounded in their body? And just using simple breath awareness or just really simple, just deep breathing techniques. Like, you know, uh, what is it just like to take a deep, three deep breaths into your belly? So inhaling through the nose and then holding it in the belly and then exhaling through the mouth and do that three times. And what is that like? So it doesn't need to be this huge long thing. It's just trying to get people more aware of their body and aware of their breath. And when somebody feels stable enough, stable enough <laughs> um, to start to maybe process some bigger things, then we can move into a, a different stage. And that's to help to uh, process some more of the somatic stuff. So all this trauma or tension that's trapped in our body. And you, know, you could use a, a modified version of something like transpersonal breath work. So have somebody lay down on the floor we could play music or I like to use a drum sometimes for these short things. So I have a frame drum and I like the vibration and you know, that trance, it can just put you in a trance state pretty quick. And there's also something relaxing about the drum beat. Um, yeah, and so, you know, Sorry, I'm just going to add to that. I, I'm a huge fan of drum work. Um, yeah. if I, if I, I started with drums by listening to uh, people playing the drums and then I actually went and purchased drums and just in terms of the shamanism type of uh, approach to meditation, if I listen to that for 10 to 15 minutes, I'm gone. Like I yeah. can I'm gone. Yeah. Like if I get into a deep breathing, you know, quiet, relaxed state, it's it's crazy how transformative that can be. Like, yeah. So, please, please go on. so that's actually like my main thing that I've been using in my my clinical practice is using drum and breath. I didn't add that into the capstone um, part, but you know, that's a huge part of the work that I do. Um, you're just doing like simple journey work or just drumming. And it's always surprising because I pull out the drum, people are like, how am I going to meditate to this? And then after 10 or 15 minutes, they're like, what just happened? I'm so tired. Or I felt like I was dreaming. And <laughs> I'm like, yeah, yeah, yeah. pretty interesting. So <clears throat> You know, you could use that as the evocative music part and, and help them to intensify their breathing. Um, and so, you know, I did this with somebody that just felt so stuck. They were so closed off. So I had them lay down on the floor and they're very quiet. Like sometimes I have a hard, hard time hearing them. And they were just doing deep in, intensified breathing for about uh, 10 or 15 minutes while I was playing some music. So deep intensified breathing would look like... <sighs> just getting that energy activated. And afterwards, they're just much more animated. I could hear them, they're speaking up louder. Um, nothing too transpersonal happened, but it was just to help them bring some stuff to the surface. Um, you know, maybe if they're, they are too activated, so I broke that second phase down to two parts. Um, if stuff is already at the surface, maybe the activating breath isn't really what you need, but it could be something like what we described, like going in your room, listening to music, taking a couple deep breaths into that anxiety that you're feeling in the stomach, and maybe just doing a little bit of self-massage and just becoming um, more curious and exploring that, those som somatic sensations. Um, so the second phase is really about somatic processing. Um, how do we get this stuff up out of our body or how do we work with it if it's already at the surface and it's visible? And then the third phase is, you know, at this point, hopefully somebody is, you know, pretty stable at that point and they're not having as many flashbacks and um, or being too dissociated or hypervigilant. Then you can, we can move somebody into uh, some group work, something like holotropic or transpersonal breath work that's more outside the clinical practice. Um, and I think that's really important because the group work, it... Um, we're humans and we're social beings. And as my teacher Lenny always says, we're the descendants of very successful tribes. And you know, the ones that went off on their own probably didn't make it. And so, you know, the group really 
holds this, this special container to, to do work, to feel supported in. And then having these big kind of transpersonal experiences can also, you know, add a whole other layer of healing that um, isn't always achieved in talk therapy or, or anything like that. Mm. And then, sorry, did you get into the third phase or? or uh... Yeah, so the third phase would be like I described it like outside the clinical um, practice and that's more transpersonal and, and group work um, because it's longer, you know, you're going to a weekend retreat or you're at a, um, a full day workshop, it's like 12 to 14 hours. So it's more outside of like a therapy practice. So the first two are more for like in therapy, working with people with trauma or high anxiety disorders. And then the third is moving out and doing more of this self-exploration and spiritual development. Um, you know, I think we overlook that at times um, within clinical stuff of like how, you know, that work can actually help heal us in much different ways than just trying to figure out your biographical stuff. And mm. let's just keep talking about it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And now yeah. getting back to set setting, have you ever had someone or done any session, therapy sessions with someone out in, nature out in the forest you know forest bathing type of thing to put them in this sort of environment that it's just very natural very relaxing very calm and help bring them into that that residence let's say have you ever tried anything like that or is it mostly done in, indoors mostly done indoors um i have done outdoor stuff so i was contracted um to Wonderlust for two years and did uh, hikes. And so I would bring people out and most of my hikes were either drumming or we do like 20 to 30 minutes of breathing out in nature. And then I also did some like just smaller workshops that people wanted to do outside. Outside's great. The only thing with it is, um, you know, if you're playing music, you need to find somewhere to plug in. Hopefully, you know, I have a Bluetooth speaker that plays okay, but, um, but then, you know, the, the weather, I mean, there's times when people are inhaling and, and breathing deep and a bug flies in their mouth. So, you know, it's just a little bit like, yeah. it's not as controlled as, as inside. But, you know, I think it definitely works. And uh, I, I've definitely enjoyed facilitating those experiences for people. Because mm. I think, yeah, being in nature, is just so, it's just a, a different experience. Yeah, like I find that's one of my, that's like a go-to for me if I'm feeling really like aroused, really wound up. I just can sometimes go for a walk. I live by the water, so I just go down and just sit at the water. It's funny, I actually saw someone there a few months back and they had one of those uh, small handheld shamanic drums and they were sitting at the water on some stones banging it. And I was like, oh, this is perfect. <laughs> I'm just gonna hang out right here. Yeah. Uh, other time I went down to the water, there was, I was listening to a Zen audiobook, mm. and there was a heron and it was just sitting on this rock and I must've watched it for about 20 minutes and it would just every few minutes pluck down in the water and grab a fish. And mm. I was just trying to be with this parent who had the just so much patience and stillness to like, and it was landing, like getting fish. I must have gotten about five or six fish while I was watching it and listening to this audiobook. I was like, this is absolute bliss. Like, this is perfect. I, I like didn't think about work. I couldn't think about anything else except like this heron just getting these fish. It was That's absolutely true. amazing. So I'm just a, I love just, and I preach so much about people getting out of nature because especially we were talking earlier before this podcast started about like different cities and whatnot. When I go into the city of Toronto, if I go to New York, I look around, I'm like, wow, just reflective buildings everywhere. The sun is beaming off of these glass towers and there's not a tree in sight. Like there is not anything that you can walk up to and just touch that I would say is more rooted in what's like natural, you know, it's, it's all right. just man-made machinery. And that, that just reinforces that, that mechanistic, mechanistic way or, of thinking of yourself, you know, of a human being is now you think you're a robot, you think you're a machine, you're not natural because you're not put in those environments that, you know, make you feel so connected to it. And I, I know a lot of people live in these downtown environments where they're just up in these huge towers. And when you're up 40 floors up, how can you be grounded? You know, it's just- I feel vertigo when I'm in places like that. I'm like, oh. <laughs> yeah, like it, it's absolutely crazy. Um, so I wanted to ask you your opinion on, and we briefly touched on it here, but your opinion on, on what role psychedelics plays in, in either trauma therapy or just, just evolution of some of personal development as a whole. And I know MAPS is, is becoming widely discussed and a lot of their research as well, which I'm so, so pleased about because I feel like a lot of this stuff has been uh, very taboo, especially the psychedelic yeah. stuff. Even when I talk to some, uh, some people that are a little bit older and I bring up that I've 
had sort of experiences and they you know are related to psychedelics. But I've also done a lot of research and I have similar experiences I've read on from near death uh, near death experiences people have had very very similar to psychedelic ones I've had. And it all sort of brings everything together. But whenever I talk to someone of a certain generation, it, it seems very taboo. So I wanted to get your opinion on where you think things are going with the use of psychedelics and, and trauma therapies. Um, and, and yeah, just get your overall opinion on it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is a big combo. Um, try to break it down as best as I can of what my thoughts are about this. Um, yeah, as you mentioned, MAPS is doing some wonderful work, and I think that will be at the forefront of trauma treatment. Um, so MAPS, the Multidisciplinary Association for Psychedelic Studies, if nobody knows about that. Um, they're a nonprofit company that have been funding MDMA-assisted psychotherapy, and if nobody knows what MDMA is, you think about ecstasy. Um, <laughs> It's the um, main compound in that. Um, and so MDMA is a really interesting compound because it um, affects the, the limbic system, which is so overactive with PTSD, specifically the amygdala, which is like the fear processing part of the brain. And so when people have trauma and they're experiencing flashbacks and, and whatnot, you know, the limbic system is, is just going off. What MDMA does is it decreases blood flow to the left part of the amygdala, which helps people revisit a lot of these memories or these feelings without the fear. And so it's important to stress of what MAPS is doing is that they're doing MDMA assisted psychotherapy. It's not just providing a drug and letting people take it. You know, people have pre-sessions, they have their sessions um, with MDMA and they're getting therapy while they're uh, on the substance. And then they have a lot of post um, sessions. And, you know, the research so far is pretty promising. The results are pretty promising. Um, it probably is the most exciting type of trauma treatment out there, just in terms of like the uh, positive outcomes um, from what the studies are showing so far. And so, you know, I think we'll see a few different camps. Um, first, what MAPS is doing and some what other some other organizations are doing. They're really focusing on the medicalization of psychedelics. Um, so treating uh, clinical mental health disorders, PTSD, um, treatment resistant depression, and, and stuff like that, near death anxiety. Um, so people suffering from like a terminal illness that are suffering from anxiety there. <clears throat> and there's multiple different research projects going on. So MDMA specifically being researched for PTSD, um, the active ingredient in psilocybin mushrooms, um, magic mushrooms, psilocybin, that's being investigated and it has been investigated in the past for the near, near death anxiety. Um, some places are seeing the potential for possible uh, treatment for addiction or alcoholism. I know a site at NYU has been running a study with psilocybin assisted therapy for alcoholism. So I think what we'll see first is like this medicalization. And there's um, some controversy around it within the psychedelic community just because access, um, you know, might not be affordable for people that need it. Um, and so people will continue to possibly seek out these other areas. Um, so when people think of like ayahuasca, you think of sh shamanic contexts. And so I think that will always exist. You'll have some medicalization. You'll, I think you'll have the shamanic traditions still. And then um, what Joe and I talk about and what our teacher talk about often is the creativity aspect. So as I mentioned Stan Groff's name earlier, he was a pioneer in LSD research. He was doing that research in, uh, pr over in Czechoslovakia, then he came over here and did a little bit uh, down in Maryland before the counterculture hit and everything became illegal. But Lenny, our teacher was like, Stan, isn't this great? All, all this research is starting to come back and people are doing this. And you know, Stan said, you know, it's, it, it's great, but most of it's been done before. <laughs> um, he's like, the real potential here is creativity. And when I think about that, I think that is a really important part of having transpersonal experiences is the creative part, because, you know, we're going to be dealing with a lot of dire situations. I mean, if you believe in climate change or you don't, like, you know, things are changing so rapidly. And I think we need new creative ways of problem solving. And, um, you know, while treating mental health and treating clinical diagnoses is important, I also think some of the real potential here is in creative problem solving and just um, 
just having these experiences like I first got into this because I had this near-death experience that really woke me woke me up like it was a transpersonal experience really showed me how how the world is not how it is at times um and I always thought like wow if somebody could have an experience like this like it would really help them kind of break out of this normal way of seeing the world and then I came across like psilocybin mushrooms and I had such a parallel experience like you mentioned near-death experience it's similar to a psychedelic experience I mean that's what got me so interested in it was I had this experience it was on par with my near-death experience and it freaked me out it's like oh my god like how could I take that and that was a near-death experience and I was like oh man if people could have access to something like this and really kind of do their own healing I mean where would the world be? You know, if people could become a little bit more curious about themselves and be a little bit more creative, I mean, where would we be right now, right? And so there's the, these tools have the potential to heal, to foster creativity, self-development, um, you know, even spiritual practices. So deepening meditation, prayer, whatever that is. And, you know, there's also the dark side and opposite. You know, these aren't all panacea, silver bullets, or they aren't going to really cure everything um they do have a a, a a dark side at times and people can do a lot of spiritual bypassing people become manic um as we like to say like you know they can really foster spiritual emergence processes and spiritual emergence is something that looks sometimes like bipolar or schizophrenia and they can really open people up and i think one challenge to all this is our culture lacks a framework for these experiences and our culture doesn't have a framework to integrate these experiences. And so that's been my huge, like my main focus for the past few years. Well, I guess since I had my near-death experience, like how am I, we're all susceptible to a, a transpersonal experience. You know, you be driving, get in a car accident, you could open up, but how, how do you come back and then live? life after you've had your your reality shattered and you know that's something psychedelics have the potential to kind of shatter your reality but then we come back and we go oh man now what <laughs> you know it's pretty common some people are like i want to quit my job this isn't meaningful anymore um you know i want to make a life change but i think our culture kind of lacks this just this framework for understanding these experiences and i just don't think certain aspects of capitalism work with you know once you start thinking this way or just having a certain experience of like wow there's so many other ways about living and this isn't the only way like we could have so many other ways of living and for some reason we're just kind of boxed into this way of living and so when you have these experiences and you start fighting against it you're like oh what's going on like how do, how do I live now <laughs> um yeah. so I think that that's the main challenge that we're probably going to start to bump up against is how are we integrating these big transformative experiences? And now that like, you know, all these spiritual practices are starting to become more out there. I mean, look at yoga, breath work is starting to become a practice that's been, um, you know, starting to become a little bit more mainstream. Psychedelics are starting to become a little bit more mainstream and people are interested, right? People feel like some people are just like lacking a lot of purpose and meaning. We are just very overstimulated with technology all the time. And we're just like, what are we doing? And you know, we have all these techniques now that might foster some sort of breakthrough experience. And then, but then how are we coming back and showing up in our daily lives? I think that that's the biggest challenge. Right. Yeah, it is pretty challenging. And, and I've experienced that as well. I mean, if I've had, you know, actually, if I've been, I've been uh, high on psychedelics and been around other people that are not. And just being there, and it's almost like you're just at a different, I don't even know how to use the word frequency, but you're just, you're, you're some, you're just not meshing right and it's almost like everyone's built up these uh these, their lego towers uh, understanding who they are and what they do and this is my job and da, 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 da. take a psychedelic and someone walks by and knocks over all those legos and it's a clear table and you're like whoa what the hell is going? like you know it's like perfectly ground up and you're like shoot okay so this is how it is right and this is what i have to work with so i think that a lot of like kind of what, what you alluded to there with the different avenues and different modalities of bringing someone to that state, be it yoga, breath work, uh, if they do have a near death experience, or, you know, I find a lot of actual conversations such as this, at least allude to, or sorry, bring to light some of the, um, some of the potential that these experiences hold. And I think a lot of people are, as, as you said, tuning into it. And I think just these open conversations are really what, what's getting people there and podcasts, what, what you and Joe have as psychedelics today. So I, 
didn't really get an opportunity to thank you guys for that. But it's a really great podcast you set oh, thank up. You. Um, you have some really great guests on there as well. Um, so I just want to one final question. I'm I'm a big uh, I'm big into Rupert Rupert Sheldrake and his mm. with uh, Morbid Resonance, and you briefly touched on it earlier that someone can carry over trauma, and you refer to it as past life. Um, I I even consider it as just culturally being carried over generationally again and again and again, and it's like all of the um, the framework even for how you deal with or how you return to the world after having psychedelics. It's almost been unlearned over the past. I don't even know, a few generations. And now people don't really, like, it, I swear, everyone used to know what these things were. They used to know how to structure the, their use and how to reintegrate yourself into the world after trying them. Like, everything used to be very well understood in a lot of, you know, more ancient cultures and civilizations. But now we get into our modern culture and everyone's just forgotten. And mm-hmm. everyone doesn't really, you know, so I find it's a forgetfulness that's taking place. And uh, the morphic resonance, it's almost like they can carry over their traumas, their fears, but they also carry a remembrance of what that is. So even when I had psychedelics the very, very first time, I think it might have been magic mushrooms, I, it felt familiar to me. Mm-hmm. It felt like, hey, I've been here. Like, sure, my Lego blocks all knocked down, everything's clear, but I was like, I've been here before. I almost feel like I've been here many, many times before. But I, in this lifetime, I mean, I haven't had any substances to lead me in this direction, but it just felt very familiar to me. So uh, if you are familiar with Rupert Sheldrake's work and, and all that, have you had anyone come into uh, your practice or have you ever worked with anyone with their trauma? And maybe they didn't even have any experiences with traumas coming up. It's just, they don't really know where it's coming from. It's like it's coming right out of left field. Um, or uh, on the flip side of that, have you had anyone that's gone through any breath work or, or reached like a, a breaking a breakthrough point? And that is then familiar to them as well. So. You know, on both ends of that, have you had these people that these things come up, and it's not necessarily even within their lifetime or their lifespan that you know they're they're this is happening or this is coming up from, um, but it's still coming up, and, and you kind of have to work with them, work them through that. Yeah, um, it, I mean, it's interesting the transgenerational or there's different terminology for it, transgenerational or intergenerational trauma, um, and there's some interesting research now with like epigenetics and like how these experiences could potentially uh, alter epigenetic and kind of this on and off switch, but it's not like necessarily in the DNA, but it's just influencing the way that these genes are expressing themselves. And, um, you know, it's just really fascinating research. If anybody wants to dig deeper into that, I'd highly suggest it. Um, But yeah, there's been people that like, you know, they come in and they, you know, they, they present okay, say like in a, in a breathwork workshop and, you know, they don't think anything is there and all of a sudden they have an experience of them just, you know, reliving some intense thing from say like a past life or something that's been passed down in their gener- in their uh, family lineage. And it's, it just helps to provide some sort of insight. Right. And it's like, whoa, like for example, somebody had this experience of, um, you know, experiencing um, somebody r- coming home from the war, suffering from PTSD, they didn't understand the PTSD, and then how that affected their father, and then how that has affected them. And they go, oh, man. So it just, it, it can really help, like, maybe put some things in perspective of, like, you know, my father might have been like this because his father suffered from the war and PTSD, and he took it out on his father, and then the father took it out on this person, and, you know, is it, whose fault is it, right? And so as I'm actually in the process of writing um, a final paper on transgenerational trauma um, for my somatic and trauma course this semester. And it got me thinking like, what if like a lot of mental health stuff is actually just manifestations of different intergenerational trauma and it's stuff that we're not looking at because we don't have these techniques or therapies to maybe understand the, the framework. So working with something like breath work, maybe you can develop a new narrative around it, right? It, 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 like these transpersonal experiences can help you develop a new narrative and explore it in a different way and be like, oh, my anxiety is attached to this thing that happened to so-and-so in my family. And it is really interesting. Once you start exploring these transpersonal states, more and more stuff kind of starts appearing. Um, I always had this draw to go out to Colorado and I was thinking about moving out to Leadville, Colorado. I wanted to go to a school out there. And um, 
I got really sick. I canceled the trip. My mom went out there though. And years later, my mom got really into genealogy and she gave me this letter from her father's side of the family. I don't know when it was dated, like 17, 18, 1800s. And I'm reading it. And after I'm done, she's like, did you see what was going on there? So I guess I had this relative way down in my uh, grandfather's side who established in Leadville, Colorado <laughs> and built this huge produce company and shipped produce all throughout the United States. And it's just so weird how you have these certain like attractions to places or these draws or these anxieties. And what is that? Um, and it is really interesting once you start looking into like the family lineage or you know just different things like that, how maybe it could explain some of that. Um, you know, the science is still young, pretty new, and it's hard to say this is what's happening. But, um, you know, from a transpersonal framework, I mean, anything could possibly po be possible, you know. It's, uh, mm. it's, it's really interesting. interesting. It's, a, it's almost even just a thought experiment to think like it's not just someone's own personal trauma, but it's, it's trauma that's been carried over for generations and generations. And yeah, I think a lot of people are carrying a lot of that, and it is something that's not widely discussed enough that people just don't really know why the hell they feel this way. And sometimes it could be connected or traced back to, yeah, in your case there, you just have this calling to go travel somewhere. It's like, oh, that's why, you know? I have family there, so weird. Yeah. Um, yeah, and a lot of this, some of this like theory and research started from uh, observing behaviors and some of the, um, some things going on with uh, the children of Holocaust survivors. Um, and noticing that some of these children had a higher uh, rate of PTSD or higher risk of developing certain diseases and stuff like that. And it's like, what's going on there? It's almost like they're suffering from a trauma worse than their parents were. Um, and I was just reading an article how maybe that, that study was kind of blown up a little bit, but um, you know, it's interesting. And um, Yeah, yeah, I'm just glad that, that us as a, as a civilization culture going forward in the sort of modern age, we're exploring these ideas we're talking about them and we're making efforts to better understand them. So I think that kind of uh, is a good point to end this, this podcast on. And uh, I'd like to take the, uh, take this time to thank you for coming on and having this chat. Is there anything you wanted to plug, share, anything that's coming up, or anything you want anyone to know about? I'll put, I think um, I'll put all your, your information in the description below uh, of this episode as well in the video and on the iTunes, but anything you want to share in particular? Yeah, and I just want to say thanks for the opportunity. It's always fun to be on the other side um, since I'm uh, like interviewing people all the time. So it's fun to actually be able to talk a little bit more. So thanks for the opportunity. Um, yeah, if anybody wants to learn more, you could check out uh, our website, psychedelicstoday.com. Um, my personal website is settingsunwellness.com. Um, and you can find me on Instagram on setting sun, psychedelics today. And um, we do, at psychedelics today, we do offer online psychedelic education. If anybody's interested in that, we do have a, a, a course called Navigating Psychedelics, Lessons on Self-Care and Integration, where we go over harm reduction tips. We uh, give you a framework for understanding transpersonal experiences, how to work through difficult experiences, the different contexts, and then really focus a lot on um, integration and really how to move these experiences forward. So really maximizing the benefit, reducing harm, trying to keep people safe. Um, we have three live supported courses coming up, but I don't know when this is going to air, so it might already be past date, but if it airs soon, um, our, our live support courses start in mid-May. We have one for therapists and clinicians. We have another one for physicians and another track just for the general public. And, um, you know, we'll probably continue to keep doing that. So even if you missed it, just check it out. We'll probably continue to keep rolling those out throughout the year. So. Very cool. Yeah, and the best way to stay informed is follow the Instagram, follow, bookmark the website, and stay up to speed. I hope you guys start doing video as well. That'd be really cool. Yeah, we need to do more. <laughs> yeah, yeah. All right, perfect. Well, thank you, Kyle, and uh, talk again soon. Take care. Thanks so much. Yeah.